Wonderful. Very inspiring. Thank you, Laura. Elena and Julie. Thank you so much. These are the rising stars at, in the Surrey Filipino Church, man. It's unbelievable. They're going to take the place of uh, Mylene and uh, Serena. <laughs> they are our new singers for tomorrow. Praise the Lord, guys. Have you been blessed with the meetings from Pastor Break? Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, tonight we're going to take an offering. If you have something to give towards the expenses of these meetings, uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do that tonight, if you're able. Let's do that. Uh, Jen Jenica's here today. Jenica, do you want to play a song while we take an offering? Something from the hymn book? Jenica's visiting from CUC, so she's off on Sunday. And uh, let's give her a role to play tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. How are you? Nice to see you all here. I, I think some of you had to swim to come here. Uh, we did, and I'm glad that our car floated down the, the river called 60th Avenue uh, to, to get here. Anyway, nice to see you all. What do you remember from last weekend? Anything that I said from last weekend? I mean, anything. Anything, please. Yes, please. Don't follow mirages. Good, that is true. And everybody else remember anything about that? Don't follow mirages. That was on Friday night. We talked about how the world offers a mirage and how behind the scenes there's the real stuff going on, the spiritual stuff. Um, last uh, f Sunday, I shared my own story and what God did for me. Anybody remember anything from that at all? Yeah. Admit that you want 
You want something better. And that was actually one of the, f the three steps that led an atheist to God, is the need for something better, just to admit that. And, and my attempt is to kind of build up people's faith, those who don't have too much faith but yet want faith. And, and if you know that this life is, some, is not something you want to stay with, you want something better, you want something more, that's most likely the Holy Spirit working on you even, even right now. It's quite possible. Um, now, I also talked about, what else did I talk about last weekend? Anything? We gave reasons to believe, and we really only scratched the surface, actually, on reasons for believe. I, I, I was kind of intellectual, scientific, and in some of those things that I was saying. But, you know, a lot of people, like myself as a younger man, needed that. Because often, Christianity comes with all these claims. And some people think, oh, that's not scientific. Well, there is a lot of scientific stuff that goes along with Christianity. And I'm, I'm even going to be sharing some of that even tonight, this, this very night. And so, I thank you very much. And so I'm going to begin, but before I begin, I'd like to pray. So let's pray, shall we? Our Father in heaven, Lord, again, one more time, we ask that you'd uh, help us to give attention to your still small voice as you speak to us in this next 45 to 60 minutes or so tonight. Lord, you want to lift us up. You want to give us a better life. This life is not meant to continue the way it now is. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, use me in, in some way to be able to speak to your people that they may not hear my voice but yours. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, our topic tonight is called Life at Its Best, Healthful Living. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this is to give you something that is very, very helpful, but it's not commercial. And there's many collaborating studies that prove this, and it's simple to understand. Now, last weekend, I talked about uh, on my, my testimony on, on Sunday night. One of the main Bible verses that helped me to take a, a step toward faith was this one right here. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is a man who puts his trust in him. Taste and see. God is calling you and me just simply to say, listen, Taste me. Check me out. Just to see if it actually works. Just taste and see. Well, I'd like to submit to you that that is actually an invitation to you and to me to experiment with the Word of God. Take God at His Word. All those promises that are in the Bible, stand on the promises rather than sitting on the premises like you talked about, and, and take God at His Word and just see where that leads you. So that's kind of what I did when I was a young man, taste and see. Now, I thought, okay, if the Bible has reasons to believe in it, if there's reasons to believe, scientific reasons to believe in God and the Bible and Jesus and all that stuff, is it possible that we could use the Bible for other things? For example, energy and health. Are there Bible principles right in the Bible that will help us to actually feel better in this life, never mind eternal life. And so, and I found out that sure enough, yes, there is. So here is the experiment. I'm going to challenge you tonight for a 30-day experiment. This is a number line of time, and that X marks the spot where you are right now in your life. But 30 days from now, when would that be? Right now it's what, March 27th, I think? So, 28th, thank you, I lost a day. And so next month, next month, April 27th, something like that, in 30 days, you will be right here, where the X is right there, there it is. Now, in those 30 days, I'm gonna challenge you to experiment with the Word of God. I'm gonna challenge you. And then here's what I'm gonna say. Uh, here's a self-test you can do, and the question that you'll ask in 30 days is, are you healthier? Do you feel more energetic? 
Now, if the Bible is true at all, it goes on record to say certain things about what you can do for your health and for your life and for your energy level and vitality. Now, if the Bible is false, it's just a theory, that's just like any other book. But if it's true, there's something that we ought to be able to put it to the test, and it should make a measurable difference in our lives. Does that make sense to you? Okay? So that is why this is like a, almost like a scientific approach to the Bible. Just check it out. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about health today, and I hope that in talking about health from the Bible, that that'll increase the credibility of the Scriptures. Increase the credibility of Scriptures. I'm going to only scratch the surface, as I all only can do uh, each time, but here's what we can talk about. Now, I don't know if you've ever read National Geographic. Anybody ever read National Geographic? Yeah, a few of you do. Yeah, about 10 of you maybe. Well, this was an issue that came out about, I don't know, three, four, five years ago. And that man who's standing on his head is 100 years old. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an old guy, but look what he's doing. How can a 100-year-old man do that? What's going on? And so the author, the guy who wrote the article, the guy who interviewed this man, he also wrote a book. It's called The Blue Zones. And in that book, it says, Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who've Lived the Longest. And the guy's name is Dan Butner. I'm going to read this. It says, Is there in our vast and wondrous planet an antidote for old age, a magical elixir that fixes everything, or a bubbling fountain of youth? Dan Butner's new book, The Blue Zones, Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who Live the Longest, is a foundation of sensible, scientifically verified advice. A blue zone is defined as a healthy culture that contains many healthy persons aged 90 or 100 years old. Can you imagine? I mean, how many people live that age? There's, there's a few, but there are some places in the world where there's a lot of them all together. A blue zone, okay, this book provi uh, profiles dozens of these venerable nonagenarians and centenarians around the world in four pockets of longevity. Longevity means you live long, longevity. The uh, Barbagia region of Sardinia, the island of Okinawa and Japan, Loma Linda, California, the headquarters, it says the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, well, it's one of the local headquarters, and uh, on the island of Costa Rica. These are four places that they found that people live like a really long time. So what's going on here? So he wanted to study it. And the 90-year-olds and the 100-year-olds who inhabit them are physically active and mentally alert. Now, my grandparents, when they, they never reached that age. They died in their 80s. And I remember my grandfather, I mean, he pretty well lived in his chair for the last 20 years of his life. I mean, he wasn't very active. He wasn't very active at all. And yet there are people who are. Is, how do we get to be that way? According to Butner, your genes influence your lifespan by a factor of only 25%. So you say, oh, it's genetic. I can't help it. You know, my mother, my father. Well, 25%, that's true. But there's 75% that we can actually control that is not related to the genetics. We, what we do with our lives matters more than what we were born with. Caring for our bodies is one facet of a long, healthy life. The other aspect revolves around the life within, like the spiritual life, the psychological, the emotional life. All these people interviewed in the book are cheerful and thankful and have a strong sense of purpose. Did you get this? A 107-year-old Seventh-day Adventist woman in Loma Linda says, life is short. Don't run so fast that you miss it. And she says that at 107. Amazing what they can do. Well, because of, because of what was in that book and because of what was in the National Geographic, I got very interested. And one of those places is Loma Linda where a lot of Seventh-day Adventists live. And I thought, hey, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I wonder what the secret is so I can live long. What, what can I do here? And they found out 
that this group of people called the Seventh-day Adventists who are from all kinds of cultures and they're mixed, they're mixed in Sardinia, they're all like Italian or European. In, in Okinawa, they're all Japanese and so they have similar genes. But in La Melinda, genetics is not a factor at all. They're all from different cultures and different languages and, and yet they're all Seventh-day Adventists and yet still they live 90 and 100 years old. What's going on? And so if you were to ask them what was going on, they would point to some places in the Bible. And I will start quoting this right here. It says, Exodus chapter 15, written by Moses about 1450 B.C. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. Remember we talked about that on Friday night about suffering. His statutes are like regulations or prescriptions for happiness. I will put none of the diseases on you which I've brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Well, that's kind of curious. What kind of diseases did the Egyptians have? And is it possible that that Bible passage is actually true? Is it true? If we listen to God and trust what he says in the Bible, will we go without diseases? I mean, that's kind of what it says, right? Remember what it says, taste and see. Like, check it out, all right? And then in Psalm 105, which was written about 500 years later by David, most likely, and there was none feeble among his tribes. So the Bible says that the God's word was true, that they did not have those diseases. Now, the interesting thing here is in Exodus 23, 25, it says, I'll take sickness from you. Well, you go back to the time of the Egyptians. And the interesting thing is, is when people died in Egypt, especially if they were um, rich people and royalty, but lots and lots of people, they turned them into mummies. They would preserve them and they had a, a ritual with burial and everything else. And those mummies, because of the dry climate of Egypt, you can actually go there and kind of dig them up and, and you can examine their bodies like 2,000, 3,000 years later. And studies were done on Egyptian mummies and they confirmed the truthfulness of God's word. Now, Dr. Rosalie David, she's an English lady, doctor from Manchester University in England, and she went and she took a look at all these mummies. Here's another doctor, Dr. Claude Rufis. He did x-rays, can you imagine? 14,000 mummies. I mean, I didn't even know there were that many mummies. 14,000 of them. He did x-rays on them. And so the idea was, what did they die from? What kinds of diseases did they die from? Heart disease, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, rheumatism, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Does any of that sound familiar? We're dying of that today. It's exactly the same as it is today. And the richer they were, the younger they died because they get all the rich foods which was filled with salt and sugar and fats and everything else. And we, we die earlier all because of that. So that means then, if the Egyptians had heart disease and cancer and arthritis and diabetes, which is what people die from today, a lot of people, then is it possible then that if we listen to the word of God that we would not die from that or our, the death rate from that would be less? That would be a scientific experiment to do. The Bible says, eat this, don't eat that, live that kind of lifestyle, and this will be the result. We should be able to test that out to see if it actually works. So we look in the Bible, and lo and behold, we find out that those Seventh-day Adventists that were studied in Loma Linda, California, southern part of California, not far from L.A., they actually studied them. Uh, there's a, this called the Adventist Health Study, one and two. There's one going on right now, by the way, but this is number one. The Californians, the average Californian, 
was studied against the average Seventh-day Adventist. And the average Californian, you see that top line there, that is the, the, the death rate which was set at 100%. And the SDA males and the SDA females, they died of those diseases at those uh, younger, uh, not younger, uh, less of a rate. Less of them died of that, is what I'm trying to say. Less of them died of that, as it showed here. Now, here's an example. Californians dying of all cancers, all kinds of cancers, was the standard rate at 100%. So if the Californians uh, were pegged at 100% death rate, uh, not death rate, but the, the amount of Californians dying of cancer was set at 100%, where did the Adventists fall in, more or less? For breast cancer, only... 78% of Adventists died of that, whereas for California, it was 100%. For colon cancer, 67%. For bladder cancer, 46%. For stomach cancer, 41%. For kidney cancer, 40%. For lung cancer, 20%. And so there's a very, very clear, measurable difference between the average Californian and the average Adventist Californian. And what accounts for that difference? You ask those Adventists there in Loma Linda, they'll tell you, it's because we're trying our best to follow what the Bible says. And they'll tell you that they live longer uh, and that they do different things that are different in different ways. Well, one of the tests that you can try is the same test that Daniel tried in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, this will be my main Bible passage for tonight, is Daniel chapter 1. Here's Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you see his hand is kind of put up into the air, and he's saying basically, no, I don't want to eat of the king's delicacies and the meats that were sacrificed to idols and the wine. I don't want to eat that because I have faith in the God of of my fathers that says to eat something different. And so, what does Daniel say? Here, I'm going to read it for you. Daniel chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. Daniel comes along, he says, I don't want to eat that. And the, the guy in charge says, oh no, you got to eat it. You know, it's, it's good for you. And he says, please test your servants. That means test us, your servants, for 10 days. He's saying test. Test it. This is scientific. He says, test, test this out. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat. The King James Version says pulse. I'll take a look at that in a minute. And water to drink for 10 days. Then, Daniel says, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who ate the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to do this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now, what is the royal food? Well, it's McDonald's, right? It's anything that's fat, fatty foods and sugar and sweet. It's, that's royal food. And if they only had vegetables to eat, and they are now compared in 10 days with those who had the royal food, the rich food, it cost a lot more money, to process, process that food, there's a big difference that they could see. Now, where it says, you know, that word, um, vegetables, vegetables. Scholars have been kind of debating what that word really was in Hebrew. And here's the Hebrew word, uh, zerahim. That's the Hebrew word. And the root word for that is seeds. So Daniel's saying, test us with food that either has seeds in it or is grown from seeds, as opposed to, say, meat, which you, there's no seeds in meat. It's, 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 it's an animal that you kill. And so if we try to figure that out, Daniel's saying, test us out with this. Now, Daniel probably was thinking of this Bible verse in Genesis. Here it says, Genesis 1:29. But God said, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed. The same word in Daniel which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis 1.29. You see, the logic is, if God is truly the creator 
and we are his creation, then who would know better what makes these bodies go? Does that make sense? Who would know better than the creator of the machinery? What makes the machinery work at optimum, optimum level? And so God has put it in the Bible. Here it is. And now we have the ability to check it out, to see if it really does work like he says it would work. Now, Daniel might have also been thinking about the unclean foods in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Can you name a few unclean foods? Pardon? Yeah, bacon, anything that comes from a pig. Um, rats, that's an unclean food. Camels, unclean food. Um, lobster and all shellfish, unclean foods. And so Daniel is probably thinking, okay, if it does not chew the cud and has a cloven hoof, in other words, if it's not a cow or an elk or a moose, and in the water, if it doesn't have fins and scales, because this is all written in the Bible in these, in these chapters here, then don't eat it. And so now we have a chance to say, okay, I like the taste of some of these things, but if I experiment for 30 days, maybe I'll feel so good that I would feel better than how it, how it tastes. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, my taste buds won't be the controller of my health. And so I, this is what I mean by I'm challenging you for 30 days. Check it out just to see. Just, just to see. Now, if we can find ways to understand health simply without paying any money. I'm not here. I'm not going to sell you a thing. I don't have a book I want you to buy. I don't have a product I want you to try. Nothing. I'm just going to do what I can to say, the Creator created Earth, the planet Earth for us to be sustained on. Is it possible that we can find ways to have healing and health and energy naturally? And so Weimar Institute, about an hour east of Sacramento, California, came up with an acronym called New Start. New Start. Remember, I said, one of the steps that led an atheist to God was he admitted a need for something better. He wanted a new start. And the idea was if you find out that you happen to be a created being, and the Creator has a, a, a laws and statutes and regulations for you to follow that are going to make you happy and joyful and energetic, then we can test it out, and it would be a new start. So I'm going to use the letters of new start to talk about the natural remedies, not the doctors we go to in the, in the hospitals. And I thank the Lord for our health care system. Uh, there's some pla we can complain about it, but I mean, there's a lot of good things too, and I'm thankful for that. But sometimes, if we follow what I'm going to say, we won't need the health system nearly as much. Nearly as much. It'll cost a whole lot less too. Here's Loma Linda. And Loma Linda is where that uh, health study came from. And Loma Linda has a whole lot of people, 90 years old, 100 years old, who are following this New Start kind of philosophy that comes from the Bible. So let's put these letters there on the screen, and we'll put a word next to each one. For example, the letter N stands for nutrition. So this is something you can, mem you can memorize it quite easily. The letter N stands for nutrition. And, nutrition uh, and, and when we talk about nutrition, we're talking about high-octane fuel for this machinery we call the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's just what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. What makes our bodies run at the highest level? It's kind of like a car. We have a car here, and it runs on high-octane fuel. And so when we eat nutrition that is either a fruit or a nut or a grain or a vegetable or a legume, something that, are com that comes from a seed, like Daniel did in Daniel chapter 1, when we do that, that is high-octane fuel. It's high-octane fuel, and it makes us go. And I have found that when I do this, I feel way more energetic. And when I don't do this, I feel way more lethargic 
tired, exhausted, even irritated sometimes. And so it makes a difference in my life. See if it does in your life. So a large variety of fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts and, and all that kind of stuff, God made them for us to eat. Oh, look at that apple. Doesn't it say an apple a day, what does it do? Keeps the, the doctor away, right? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. And there's your veggies as well. Now, I look at that and I say, hmm, the truth is, I don't know if I like red pepper all that much. How many here like red pepper? Raise your hands. All right, oh, quite a few of you. How many of you here like carrots? How about raw carrots? Uh, okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, now, point is here that we have three million taste buds on our tongue. But we have three trillion cells in our body. Now, if we eat this stuff, Sometimes our taste buds aren't going to have a big party, but the rest of the three trillion cells in our body are going to really love you. And sometimes when we eat the fatty foods and the sugary foods and everything else, um, it's not as great for the three trillion cells in the body, but our taste buds really love it. And so it's always this balance between what our taste buds want and what the, cell, the other cells of our body wants. Oh, there it is. Maybe you can go shopping there and get your stuff, you know. And now we talk about breakfast, to eat like a king, lunch like a prince, supper like a pauper. When we eat this way, it makes that high-octane fuel work at the most efficient possible. Big, good breakfast. I'm not going to read all this, but it talks about the benefits of the breakfast that we eat. For students in school, for example, when they eat breakfast at home before they come to school, their marks are higher. The teachers can um, enjoy the students a whole lot more. They're not as nearly as irritable. It, they did a study on this in Iowa, and they found this out. Eating a good breakfast, like oatmeal, for example, and fruit, maybe some nuts, all on there. It made a difference. And God invented the stuff. He says he wants us to eat it. Exercise. Who here exercises? Raise your hands. All right. Walking is a great exercise. Brisk walking would be great. I find my life goes better when I walk and it goes worse when I don't. Is what I find. Now who's this guy? Yeah, Paul Bunyan, right? Paul Bunyan. It's actually not, he's not a real person. Is actually invented uh, as a commercial back in the early 1900s. But the whole story is that Paul Bunyan here has an axe. And he uses his axe to chop down trees. And so I want to tell you a story about a man with an axe. He comes to work. First day of work, he has his axe. And he, um, the boss hires him on. First day he chops down more trees than everybody else. And that's Monday. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he's fired. He's fired. Why am I fired, Mr. Boss? You're fired because the first day you did great, but every day you did worse and worse and worse. What's wrong? And then he says, well, I work just as hard. I, I tell you, I sweat just as much every single day. And then the boss said, hold on a second. Did you sharpen your ax? And the guy said, well, no, it was a waste of time. If I, sharpen, if I stop to sharpen the ax, then I'm taking time away from doing the work. But the thing is, when you stopped, when you, if you were to stop to sharpen your ax, the work would go a whole lot better. You're fired. You need to be smart enough to stop to sharpen your ax. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, exercise is like sharpening the axe. Yes, it takes time. But when you sharpen the axe, it makes the rest of the day and week go a whole lot better. Everything works better in our blood system when we do that. Here's this lady, she's walking. Now the interesting thing here is, when we go through life with no exercise versus with exercise, we can actually, this has been studied out, we can actually get up to 14 hours of work done in a 10-hour period because we're more efficient. If we don't exercise, 
we can go only up to about, say, it takes us only get like nine hours work done. And so the idea here is when we exercise, we can do more. Now, can you imagine God is looking down on us? He is saying, listen, I want you to be fit, physically fit. I want you to be mentally acute. I want you to be efficient. I want you to exercise and breathe in the fresh air that I gave to you, the sunlight that I put there for you. Just test it out for 30 days and you just see if I'm not right. 30 days, April 27th. Try this out for 30 days and see where you end up. Anybody here know who this man, uh, this uh, lady is? It says Mount Whitney Trail. Her name is Hulda Crooks. Hulda Crooks was at the age of 56 um, needing to go into a wheelchair because she was so exhausted and couldn't walk very well. She felt old at 56 and then she learned about the health message. And she started to walk and walk and walk and walk. And by the time she reached 60, she was getting tired of walking. She thought she'd climb mountains instead. And so she climbed mountains when she was in her 60s and 70s and 80s. And she climbed mountains for like all the time. Uh, this is Mount Whitney, and she was called Grandma Whitney because she climbed the mountains and she was like an older lady. She went over to Japan and climbed uh, Mount Fuji many times. And so she was called Grandma Fuji over there. And she lived to a ripe old age. I forget when, how old she was when she died. The whole point is it doesn't matter what, how old you are. You can always have hope. You can always have hope. All we need to do is do it the natural way. And it's like better than taking a magic pill. It does better than that. It's God's way. That's exercise. Water. What about water? Is water good for you? Uh, name this mountain. Anybody? What's the name of that mountain? Mount what? It is. That's Mount Everest. Mount Everest is the highest peak on the land in this world. And this fellow here is the first guy who conquered it. His name was, I forget his name, uh, Edmund Hillary, I think. Yeah. Now, the reason why he was able to conquer the mountain is he studied what everybody else was doing when they were climbing Mount Everest and failed. And the average mountain climber before him was drinking two cups of water a day in that exertion to climb up to the top of the mountain, and nobody ever made it. He decided to take extra snow-melting equipment so that he would melt the snow into water and he would drink all kinds of water all day long. And he credits the water for giving him the energy to be the first man to reach the peak of Mount Everest. Well, they did some studies on water, and here's a guy, he's on a treadmill. And, and in order to further examine Dr. Hunt's theory about how water consumption affected endurance, how many here wants to have endurance? You want to have endurance. Keep on going, right? A Harvard physiologist named Dr. Pitts tested a group of trained male athletes. So these were athletes that he was, he, was, he was testing, by putting them on the treadmill and timed at three and a half miles an hour. So about five kilometers an hour. Not too fast. You can walk five kilometers an hour pretty, you know, it's a brisk walk, but not too bad at all. The first group was given no water at all. There's three groups. The first group, no water. And they lasted three and a half hours. Their temperatures rose rapidly during the test period. And in the exhaustion phase, finally reached an average of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And what's it supposed to be at? What, 98.6, right? 102 after three and a half hours of walking with no water. Now, the second group, the second group, they were allowed to drink as much water as they wanted. And their temperatures didn't rise nearly as rapidly. However, after approximately six hours of exercise on the treadmill, as the men reached their exhaustion, their body heat zoomed up. Took a long time, but it finally did zoom up. They had more endurance because they had more water. But look at the third group. The third group chose 
uh, Dr. Pitt chose a third group and carefully calibrated their water losses, like they perspired water out of their bodies, and then replaced that exact amount of water lost, about one cup every 15 minutes, one cup of water every 15 minutes, while the men were exercising. As a result, though they stayed on the treadmill seven hours, the test subjects did not experience a drastic rise in temperature like the other ones did, nor did they reach exhaustion. In fact, when they were asked how they felt, they said they replied that they could go on as long as the doctor wanted them to. Keep on going on and on and on. Why? Water. Now tell me something. Does water cost $50 a glass or even $10 a glass? I know you can buy bottled water, but you can also get it for free. And it really, if the true value of water were, were indicated by the, the cost, we should be paying like $50 for a glass of water. That's how much it's worth. And yet we get it for free if we want to get it for free. Or we can drink it in bottles. And it's, it works like magic. It keeps our endurance going. God wants that for you and me. He wants you to be energetic. He wants you to have endurance. He wants you to have that joy and happiness that comes from living a life of vitality. And it's natural. It's natural. Well, some people say, but I don't feel thirsty. That's why I don't drink water. Well, here's several conclusions that those guys came up with. The first is that thirst isn't necessarily a good indicator of the body's need for water. You must, in general, drink more liquid than your thirst seems to call for. More, not less, but more. Second, there's a close relationship between water consumption and fatigue. They simply didn't get as tired because they drank the water. Third, water appears to have a significant effect on the regulation of body temperature. They found that out. And fourth, a more active person is in greater need of water because of the dehydrating effects of perspiration and rapid breathing. I think that makes good sense there. So we find out that water is, is like a magical elixir. If you're looking for the fountain of youth, just drink more water. God invented this stuff and he invented it for you and me. Don't you think that's wonderful? That's really something else. It can increase energy and endurance, prevent kidney stones, aid digestion and elimination, regulate the body's temperature and bring about a feeling of well-being and actually make you better looking. Water can do all those things because it makes your texture of your face more smooth. Uh, that's what water can do. I was, uh, I have here Gladys arthritis. I want to tell you a little bit of a story. Gladys is actually my father's wife. My father remarried. Uh, she married Gladys, a lovely lady. And they've been married now for 20 years or, or more. And I go back home to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I visit my father. And Gladys was complaining. This is about 10 years ago that when she gets up in the morning, she can't close her hand into a fist. Her fingers just won't move that way. It hurts. It hurts. She had arthritis. So I had just heard about water and what water does. I said, why don't you drink two cups of water as soon as you get up in the morning and see what that does? I don't know. Can't hurt. Won't cost you anything. Give it a go. Well, I forgot about that, and I was visiting, I visit about once every year or two, and I was visiting a few years ago, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years after I said that. Totally forgot what I said. We were sitting down eating a meal, and we had my aunts and uncles around, and we're all drink, uh, eating and drinking, uh, not drinking anything but good stuff, together. And she was saying, um, she was telling my aunt about what happened when she couldn't close her hand because it would hurt to make a fist, but she's been able to do that now for seven years. And so she told my aunt, you should do it too because you'll be helpful. And then she said, and my, my, uh, I don't know what I am to her. I'm not her son. Stepson? Anyway, me. She's talking about me. Yeah. She said, he told me this seven years ago. And now I am able to go work in the garden. I can you know, pinch things and stuff. It was such a handicap that I couldn't close my hand. And now, just for water. That's all it took was water. And I drink all this water, and it's like magic. It works like magic. So I say, praise the Lord, don't you? Isn't that something? Simple. God invented 
water. And he wants us to use it for our own benefit. The soldiers who are washed in cold water in the river had less sickness, another study that was done. And so the S stands for sunlight, sunlight. Uh, sunlight kills bacteria. It reduces depression, bone fractures even, um, and it reduces the need for pain medication. Sunlight does that, plus a hundred more things. Sunlight does that. T stands for temperance. What does that mean? Well, avoiding what's harmful and everything else that's good for you in balance, right? Not overeating, not being a glutton and things like that. Temperance. An extra 10 years of life were given to those people who took these principles and put them into practice. The Adventist Health Study 1, there's a 2 now, demonstrated that five simple habits Adventists have promoted over 100 years extend their life by as much as 10 years in both men and women. Here's what they said. And, and this, this is not so much from the Bible as it is from scientific studies. Regular exercise, eating a plant-based diet, eating small amounts of nuts regularly, maintaining normal body weight, and not smoking. These were the five things that the scientists discovered that help Adventists, and I'm sure anyone else, to live 10 years longer and have more energy. Well, that sounds like a secret I'd like to know more about. Uh, anybody here know why I would have this on the screen? There's an old study. Oh, it must have been like 30, 40 years ago. And they fed a spider the equivalent of two cups of coffee. The caffeine in the coffee, right? A normal spider made a, sp a spider's web like it says there in the top hand, uh, right hand, left hand corner. But then the spider that had caffeine would made a, make a web like that. He acted normal. The spider acted normal, but look at the web it, it weaved. That's the equivalent of for humans of drinking two cups of coffee a day because of the caffeine. Now, I know you probably drink coffee, but listen. If you want to try it, experiment. Don't, don't eat it, don't drink it, if it's bad for you, for 30 days. And you just see if after 30 days you want to go back to it. Give it a go. Find out. You can always go back if you want to. Um, air, fresh air. Breathing fresh air gives you a sense of well-being. It lowers anxiety. Great for those who are prone to depression. It improves learning, lowers intensity of stomach ulcers, just simple fresh air. It's good to exercise, walk in fresh air. Uh, rest. We need rest. Jesus says, come rest a while. We need to rest. Rest is something that we often lose these days because of the computer and computer games and things like that. Uh, sleep deprivation or movies at night or whatever it may be. Sleep deprivation is similar to the effect of drinking alcohol, as shown by road tests. So you say, well, I don't drink alcohol, I'm a safe driver. But no, if we're tired all the time, it's as if we did drink alcohol. And so rest is so vitally important, so vitally important. Sleep deprivation increases negative emotions as well. I remember one time I got into an accident because I was sleep deprived. And I'm suffering today, 12 years later, because of it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Get your rest. Get your sleep. There she is, sleeping really well. And turn off all the lights if you can, possibly, as well. Rest. And trust. Trust is that psychological, that spiritual, that emotional connection. When you have trust in, in a higher power like God and trust in your friends as well, it really makes sense. A huge difference. Now I recommend, here's some things I'd recommend. There's a book called The China Study. The China, anybody here ever heard of that book? Raise your hands. Called The China. Not too many people heard of that book. Uh, some of you have. It's a book written by one of the top doctors in America about what he discovered in all of the um, studies he had to do. And part of what he had to do was go over to the Philippines and, and help with uh, protein and nutrition in the, Philipp in the Philippines as part of a uh, United States uh, program in the Philippines. Read it, and you'll find out 
that what he discovered was exactly what the Bible said in the first place. Amazing. Uh, these are names that are very uh, good to explain things for us. Dr. Neil, Dr. Neil Bernard. Some of you, if you happen to be in B.C. for, oh, about 10 years ago, and you go to the Seventh-day Adventist Church camp meeting in July, Dr. Neil Bernard was there about 10 years ago, brought in by, um, what's his name, McMiller, Frank McMiller, uh, Neil Bernard. He usually charges $5,000 to come to speak. But because he knew Dr. Hans Deal, a Seventh-day Adventist, he came for a whole lot less. And Dr. Eileen Luddington are our names, or Dr. Agatha Thrash. You can go and look these names up on the Internet. And they have some good advice to help us to experience that wonderful um, energy. Dr. Agatha Thrash's website has these kinds of topics. You can click on any one of these things, and it'll give you, like, just one page of what to do about it. If you have migraine headaches, for example, if you have a diabetes, if you have shingles, if you have pain, palpitations, bronchitis, backache, blood, whatever it may be. And this is on their website. Now, I don't know the name of that website, but Dr. Agatha Thrash, I think it's called Yuchi Pines. She, she runs a, a health retreat over on the eastern seaboard. And it's amazing. So I'm, I'm giving this to you because I don't want you to suffer. If you suffer with any of these things, you have a chance to be kind of healed and, and feel, not suffer so long. So maybe you can be like this lady here at 101, and she's holding on to the National Geographic magazine because she knows she's the one, f she's following what it says there. And look how happy she is at 101 years of age. I think I'll just stop right there. What do you think, everybody? Hey, God not only cares for our souls, but he cares for our bodies as well. And he just wants, he doesn't like us to see us suffer. And so he gives these, these wonderful um, um, principles to follow so that we can have more energy, so that we can be happier and more joyful. So I'm going to give you a test. Are you ready? New start. N-E-W-S-T-A-R-T. What does the N stand for? The E. The W. The S. The T, the A, the R, and the T, trust. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us principles that make an empirical difference in our lives, the lives of your creation. And Lord, if there's anyone here who is suffering with pain Lord, maybe they can have some hope tonight that they can try this 30-day experiment and just uh, try the new start and that in 30 days from now, Lord, they may be praising you because they found out that you invented all the things that we need to heal and get better naturally. So, Lord, we thank you so much for that. Help us with our self-discipline on these kinds of things and teach us, dear Lord, how we can be happier and healthier. And we thank you for the gift in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes, please, Pastor Ken. Question. No, I didn't say it was a cure. I would never say a cure. But it helps. Yes, certainly it does. Go ahead. What's your point? <laughs> Sorry. Uh-huh. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, first of all, it's not sunshine, it's sunlight. And we can get sunlight even if it's cloudy. That's one thing. So just go outside, we'll still get sunlight. Number two, you can buy one of those lamps that have those, those, those special lights and you can shine it on yourself for 15 minutes a day and, and you'll still get the same benefits as well. And so, yeah, a lot of people say it does not need to be a sunny day. It can be a cloudy day and you still have sunlight. Just go outside. Somebody else have a hand up? I think somewhere. Yep. Nope. Yes, please. Uh huh. I heard that too, actually. And it's probably, I don't know. I don't know enough to say. I have heard doctors, such as Hans Deal and Neil Bernard, talk about that, because I'm not the expert. 
And they have said, it's a nice general rule to go by if you can, but it is not going to kill you if you put vegetables and fruits together um, on occasion. I mean, that's kind of what they've said. But I, I, I cannot quote you any studies that go one way or the other. I cannot do that. I know that part of the, um, the reasoning some scientists would give is because fruits have certain kinds of, uh, of chemicals and proteins that are... Uh, that that are better digested by the hydrochloric acid in the stomach and, and vegetables have a different kind of chemistry going on and if it's all the same kind of chemistry then it can be digested faster if it's not mixed up. I mean that's some of the reasoning behind it but truly I, I'm not an expert so I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah, I don't want to pretend to be an expert. What I would like to si simply encourage you though is try the new start. You don't even need to be a doctor. You don't need to even be smart. Now, I know all of you are smart, but you didn't need to be uh, to, to try this. The N-E-W-S-T-A-T-R-T. And God does not want us suffering. He wants us energetic. And he has given us the wherewithal to be able to do that. Okay, anybody else before we close? Yes, please. Why are seeds recommended but coffee isn't? The answer is very simple and very clear. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, the idea there is, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, that the caffeine and any chemical ends in, ending in E-I-N, e -I -N, is, uh, it works on the nervous system as opposed to nutrition on the circulatory system. And so anything that affects the nervous system is, is seen as in, in a bad way, I mean, is seen as negative. Uh, uh, seeds or things that come from seeds, like apples and carrots come from seeds and legumes come from seeds, then that acts on the circular, it, it, it makes good blood, in other words. Whereas caffeine doesn't contribute to the good blood at all. I mean, but there's much more I'm sure we could say. But the bottom line is, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm always safe to say that. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm just saying, give it a go. Experiment. You become your own expert. You become your own expert. Say, I feel better. I don't care what you say. I feel better. You know, that kind of thing. I've done, I tried it for 30 days, and I feel so much better. So give it a go. Give it a go. Any last words? All right. May God go with you, and God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Well, if you enjoy that, let's uh, hear you say amen. This topic comes very close to home, doesn't it? It's a life and death matter. And we're all interested in life, not death. Thank you for sharing those important insights for good health and happiness. Tomorrow morning, uh, 9 o'clock. You think you can make it? <laughs> you need to... You need, <laughs> you need to... <laughs> <laughs> okay, extra 10 minutes rest. We'll start at uh, on, the tot, on the dot of 9.30. We'll start singing at 9.15. How's that? Let's do that. Yeah. Uh, do we have some refreshments tonight? Do we have? Oh, praise the Lord. Let's ask, ask a blessing on that. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the inspiring word that we have heard tonight to revive, to rejuvenate, to renew our bodies, minds, and souls. We pray that we will take this seriously and that we will apply it and make some better choices, some healthier choices. We thank you for the health message that is given to us and may it benefit us. May we uh, make use of it. May it be valuable to us. Thank you for this wonderful message tonight. Bless the refreshments out there in the loving hands, hearts that put it together, made nourish and strengthen our bodies, giving you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And take us all home safe tonight and bring us back tomorrow by your grace to sit at your feet once again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.